All right, praise the Lord. Thank you for joining me. We're going to do um, kind of a different study today than what we've been uh, used to doing. First, I want to give all the glory to Jesus. Thank you for joining me again. If you're returning and if you're for the first time, welcome. Um, we've done well over 100 studies here on this channel, so we're going to be adding some once in a while. I think we've touched on most every subject. Uh, we're getting really busy here with our ministry to overseas, so we still will do studies into those mission fields and post them here. Praise the Lord. And when we get questions too, we'll certainly answer them. But in the meantime, today we're going to go through a Psalm 2 study. Praise the Lord. So let's read Psalm 2 and we're going to do some commentary on it. Why do the heathen range and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. They shall, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the degree. The Lord had said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, verse 8 says, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him praise the lord that is psalm 2 we see that psalm 2 is one of the clearest prophecies of christ's death and resurrection in the old testament praise the lord and you can look and i'm not going to read all these verses i'm going to be referencing amen but you can look and see in luke 22 44 to 46 in psalm 1 we read about the blessedness of man who walks not in the counsel of the godly i just say verse uh, 1 of psalm 1 blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful that's how psalm 1 1 starts okay so uh, we can see uh, that very clearly but rather meditates on god's law day and night by God's law, here it's obviously meant his entire word. Amen? And we don't discount any part of his word. The Old Testament perfectly uh, goes right in with the new. It's a foreshadow, amen, of Jesus' coming into the New Testament. Praise the Lord here on earth. God himself. Um, here we read about the counsel of the ungodly and rebellion against Christ, as Christ is the word of God incarnate. For example, John 1, 14, amen? And the word was made flesh, amen? And dealt, dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Revolution, revolution haha. <laughs> revelation 9, 13 says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God, amen? Forsaking's God, word in itself is rebellion against Christ. You know, people say a lot of times that, oh, Jesus came back to correct the Old Testament or to make it better or to change it. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ spoke every word in the Old Testament and in the New. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit inspired every, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Amen. No man came up with the words in these 66 books of the Bible. Praise Jesus. But the world and its leaders often go even further and actively opposed Christ and his people. This psalm is a warning and rebuke to all those who would seek to exalt their own rule and reign against Christ, whether uh, this is to kings and judges who have authority over multitudes here, as well as for all people. Amen? Since we all face the issue of whether we will submit ourselves um, to any authority we have over the others, to the word of the ultimate king and judge who has rightful claim on everyone 
and everything, the King of King and the Lord of Lords, who is Jesus, who is God. Praise the Lord. Let's look at a few key lessons we've learned from Psalm 2. It's both the unjust and insane, I mean, it's both unjust and insane to rebel against God. You know, we have in the false, quote, Main Street Church, 99 plus percent of the churches all around the world preach a false gospel. Second Peter 2, in the book of Jude, and so many other places in here tell about that heresy that's being preached today. Amen? So, it's unjust and insane to rebel against God, yet in all these churches, these so-called churches, they'll tell you that you're saved in sin which is insane Genesis 3 4 the serpent said to Eve just bite that apple just sin don't worry there'll be no consequences right isn't that what the serpent said to Eve you shall surely not die and that's what those false pastors are telling most of you that are in these false churches in the pulpits today you shall surely not die you're gonna struggle with sin it's a lie the Bible says if you sin you're of the devil 1 John 3, 8. There is no good reason for doing so, nor any chance it will be well with those who do. You sin, you go to hell. The wages of sin is eternal punishment. Amen? Not all unity is a good thing. You know, I hear people out there, we see people that are supposedly holiness, that are hanging out with wicked Calvinists, that are hanging out with Baptists, once saved, always saved. You know, these false eternal security heretics, hell-bound to curse devils. Amen? Wicked people who may not agree on anything else are often made one in their enmity against God and his ways. Those are the ones that come together and yoke together. The 36,000 denominations too, not only just, um, you know, uh, the uh, people that don't profess Christ, but all the people that do profess Christ, the ecumenical movement, are antichrist, amen? It is written uh, about the day Christ was crucified, quote, and the same day, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and Herod were, ma uh, Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. So just as all those false churches are coming together today, and they are against Christ, they profess them to know him with their lips, but their hearts are far from them, preaching that false, easy, hyper-grace gospel. Amen? But they are, uh, and as you see, and the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they they were at enmity between themselves. They were enemies. Luke 23, 12. The apostles thus quoted this psalm later in Acts, and it certainly also deals with the persecution of God's people at any time. And I'm not going to go through it, but you can read Acts 4, 21 through 31. Uh, verses 26 and 27 are direct quotes from Psalm 2. We see that a lot in the Bible, where the uh, some words in the New Testament are direct quotes from the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. Don't think that all of a sudden, once uh, after Malachi was um, uh, dictated from God and man wrote it down, praise the Lord, after the uh, last book of the Bible, then there's 400 years of silence. Don't think that things have changed since then. It was a sin to lust after some other person with your eyes in the Old Testament, and it's a sin in the New. It was a sin to murder someone in your heart in the Old Testament, and it's a sin in the New. That's another study for another day. But it's in the Bible. It was always like that. No laws have changed. Amen? Some who are blatant unbelievers understand the gospel message better than those in many of the churches. And this is true. They know Christ is a king, an authority figure, whom they are obligated to submit to. They know the call of Christ's gospel is a call to be gathered under his government, as we see in Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why do you kill the prophets? and stone at them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. And that's what you people are out there, most of you out there doing today. You're under a false headship. You're under false pastors, and it's really, really, really a shame because you're all going to hell. You need to turn to the one true God. Listen, many powerful unbelievers fight his government, not only in their hearts, but also in their governing policies. Yet the enemies of Christ in their pride don't consider the protection, salvation, and blessing in Christ's yoke. Um, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 says, Come unto me, all, that are, uh, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For you to be able to do that, you must walk as Jesus walked. And 1 John 2, 6 says, if you claim to abide in Jesus, if you're in, sitting in that pew and you say you're with Jesus, you must walk just as Jesus walked. 1 John 2, 6. Go read it. Nor do they in their pride and short-sightedness. So if you want rest, you must be in Christ. And Christ will never leave you, forsake you, as long as you are in his rest. If you leave and go sin, if you backslide, there's no more rest. He's no longer your Sabbath. Amen? Nor do they in their pride and short-sightedness consider that all the authority, power, reign, etc. of rebellious mankind will be brought down when Christ comes back. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. Let's read it. Then cometh the end when they uh, he shall be have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Praise the Lord. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifested that he is expected which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son of Man also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all, <coughs> excuse me, in all. Praise the Lord. Is it not better to submit now to the King of Kings, the author of salvation, unto all them that obey him? The captain of the Lord of hosts, as we see in Joshua 5:14, and he said, "Nay, but as the captain of the Lord of ho uh, as a captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come?" And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, "What saith my Lord unto his servant, the minister of the truth of God?" Praise the Lord, as we see in John 18:37. Pilate therefore said unto him, "Art thou a king then?" Jesus answered, "Thou sayest, I am a king." To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Praise the Lord. And also Romans 15, 8. Now I say Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Amen? Who is the embodiment of truth? John 1, 14 says, And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. This is truth. This is a living Word. Praise the Lord. And John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. Whatever should happen to your power here? What is it profited a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And we see this all the time. We see these professing Christians in these false churches on Main Street in the back roads, in a city and county and country near you. And you're in false belief. You believe you can sin and still serve the king. No, just as much as you can't go down the road 100 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour speed limit zone. Praise the Lord. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his very own soul. What shall man give in exchange for his soul? A man gives his family yokes with his unsafe family all the time. We're not talking about a man that has younger children. You should train those children up in the way they should go. We're talking about if you have grown children, if you have children that are grown, you, pass, you will be division, Luke 12, 51 to 53, and Matthew 10, 34 to 36. Praise the Lord. There's division in the house if one is a Christian and well, all the other ones are not. The house will be divided. Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but the vision. Praise the Lord. What are you giving away in exchange for your soul? Is it a high paying job? Is that what you're giving away? Is it some heresy you see on uh, YouTube University, I call it? There's so many false teachers out there. Be a Berean. Does anything you see here that you don't think I'm preaching correctly on? I need you to come tell me. Praise the Lord. Click on the link below. Go right to my website. There's a contact form. Praise the Lord. But what do you give in exchange of soul? A really good job you have to, you know, dress provocatively for? Or sacrifice too much time away from your family? Whatever it might be. Those who refuse Christ and his reign 
thus oppose themselves. And we see Acts 18, 6 say, And they that oppose themselves are blasphemed. And he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. You can't be a lukewarm Christian. Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I'm going to paraphrase, says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I'd rather you be on fire for Jesus 24-7, or I'd rather you not even uh, have come to the knowledge of the truth in the first place. Because if you're lukewarm, I am going to spew you out of my mouth. And that's what's going to happen to a lot of you out there that are sitting in these churches. You know, I used to sit in the church on a Sunday, and then I used to go to Wednesday night Bible study or whatever it was, and I used to think I was super spiritual. Woo, two, three hours a week. Man, now I'm in this book every moment I have. I'm doing ministry. I'm helping dozens of missionaries overseas. Whatever I can do, I'm laboring hard in my job to support these people. Whatever I can do, I'm doing do all for the glory of God. Those who wisely receive his reign, as verse 12 of Psalm 2 says, are blessed. No matter what loss, they should temporarily suffer as a result. And most people out there don't want to suffer the loss of family members don't want to suffer the loss of old friends. Don't want to let go of this world. When James 4.4 4 says friendship with the world makes you an enemy of a holy God. You don't want to be an enemy of God. You don't want to be a Revelation 3.16 lukewarm Christian either. And I put Christian in quotes there, right? Okay, last point. Since the powerful in the world are given such a strong exhortation to submit to Christ, to the Christ of God, and since they face an absolutely certain fearful destruction if they refuse, how much more the rest of us. And since the most vicious enemies are given the promise of mercy if they will, tr if they will in truth kiss the son and welcome in his reign, how much more can we be assured that we will be accepted if we do so? But you have to give it your all. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Revelation 20, verse 12a. I saw the dead small and great stand before God and you the Bible says in Hebrews 9 27 it's appointed for a man to die once and then the judgment you will be judged the Bible also says we our lives are but a vapor of time you could be gone tomorrow are you truly serving Christ not the way you think but the way he commands you are only his friend. John 15, 14 says, You are my friend if you do whatsoever I command you. Not half, not three quarters, not even 99%. You must do all that is written in this Bible for Jesus Christ. You can't be a part-time Christian. You are not a, quote, saved sinner. There's two types of people in this world. Saints who live holy for Jesus and obey his commands. John 15, 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. You love Jesus. There's no such thing as struggling with sin when you're in Christ. There's no such thing as depression when you're in Christ. Talking clinical. You run over your dog, you might get depressed for an hour or two. You know, stuff like that. Family member dies, you're going to feel certain, you know, sadnesses and stuff. Sure. We're talking clinical depression, clinical anxiety, right? You never go to a pharmacist now. Don't get any of those mind-altering drugs. We can go on. But I pray you uh, enjoyed this Psalm 2 study. Praise the Lord. We glorify Jesus and when we do these studies and we hope we glorified you. Down below, there's going to be a bunch of different subjects and different links. And uh, we pray you click on the ones that you look like um, you may need or that can edify you. We have a bunch of them down there. But remember, Jesus must be obeyed in everything. Don't let anybody tell you any difference. Read 1 John 2, 3 through 6. Uh, 1 John 3, 3 through 10, and, and just uh, the book of James, amen, faith without works is dead. I mean, we can go on and on and on, but you must obey Jesus Christ always. Don't believe in that false imputed righteousness uh, where Jesus kind of hovers over you, and even though you're a sinner, you know, you're wretched, God doesn't see you. Could, no, that's not in the Bible. You are saved by grace through faith. You must learn what grace and faith is truly is. Until next time, to Jesus be all the glory. Remember, he's not just a savior. He's also the Lord and he must be obeyed. Amen.